Hello and welcome to GHHU 2901 Online Research for College Students. This is Lecture 3, Research Questions and Keywords. So you might notice I'm not your regular instructor. Uh, I'm Julius Fleschner. I'm the Dean of Libraries and College Testing at GHC. Uh, I've been here going on just about four years, uh, but I've been a librarian since 2011. Uh, I am a spouse, a parent. I'm also a student doing an EDD or a higher ed doctorate at the University of North Georgia. And I am a geek. I love all things computers, technology, that whole thing. Uh, Ms. Vincent asked me to step in for this lecture just to talk to you all about research questions and keywords and how to do some refining. So let's jump in. The research process, when you think about it at a very high level, has a couple components. The ver very first one, the one that I think is really super important to get right, is identifying and developing your topic and research questions. That's what we're going to talk about today. This is really that first step in doing a research project where you ask yourself, what is it that I want to research? What do I care enough about to sit down and actually write a paper? So lots of times a college professor will give you a very broad and general topic. For example, we've all been there where the uh, professor has said, write me a paper on social media or Frankenstein or vaccines. It's your job to narrow that down as the student. The teachers aren't going to give you this very specific defined topic. They're going to want you to sit down and ask yourself, what interests me enough to sit down and write multiple pages on this topic? I think you need to ask yourself, what motivates you? What is it that you want to learn more about? If you're not interested to write it, nobody's going to be interested enough to read it. You want to make these things compelling. You don't want your paper to be the one that the instructor finds and goes, oh, I got to read this. You want it to be engaging. You want your audience to be uh, informed and think you can write well and that you've done good research. When you think about narrowing down your topic, the first thing I do when I'm told I have to write a paper is I spend a couple days just thinking about that topic. I, I question, what do I really want to do with this? And then I begin my actual writing process. If you think about general research in everyday life, there's times when we do this automatically. You might think to yourself, hey, I need a computer. Well, okay, that's pretty broad. What do you mean by computer? Do you mean a laptop? Do you mean a tablet? Uh, do you mean a smartphone? Because, you know, that's a kind of computer. Do you need a Mac or a PC? How much storage do you need? How fast is it? How much are you willing to spend? These are all ways that you're narrowing down the topic of, hey, I need a computer. So some characteristics of good research questions when we talk about how to make a good research question for a class. They tend to have one major topic. They're not too broad, meaning that there's no clear direction, like you know, writing a paper on just Frankenstein, or that they're too narrow and so, so complicated and complex that you can't find any resources. You want your questions to be complex and multifaceted. You don't want them just to be able to be answered in a yes or a no. Was Frankenstein a good book? Yes or no? That, that, there you go, you've answered your question. You want it to be more complex. You want it to be what were some of the motivations Mary Shelley had in writing Frankenstein? You want to focus your questions on a specific time, a certain population, or a geographic location. So these are really quick ways that you can narrow it down. So you could say, I want to do some research on things that happened in the 18th century uh, in Europe and uh, to uh, Irish. And, and there you go. You now have a more specific research question with these facets that then you can turn into search terms. But you want to not do what I just did, right? I just made that up off the top of my head. You want to do some preliminary research. This is where you go to the library webpage, to Galileo, uh, yes, to Wikipedia, to Google, and you just put in your topic and you see what other people are talking about as it relates to it. 
because that's going to lead you to a more interesting paper. That's going to be something that's more connected in the world around you. And that's likely going to be something your professor will actually want to read. So some examples of good research questions. Well, let's look at this first one. Was Obama a good or bad president? Do you think that's a good research question or, or a bad research question? Now, we're not taking a stance here, right? The question is, is neutral, good or bad. You can be one or the other. But this is a poor research question, mainly because it can be answered in a simple word. Uh, Obama was a good president or Obama was a bad president. What you want to do is have a more complex research question, something that gives you things to, to hang on to. Uh, how did the Affordable Care Act impact 18 to 24-year-old Americans in Georgia? This gives you a lot more to latch on to. You have to talk about the Affordable Care Act. You have to talk about how it impacted 18 to 24-year-olds. And then you have to talk about how it impacted Georgia. You can basically see how your research question or how your paper is going to work itself out. Because you know you're going to have to spend time talking about the Affordable Care Act. And you know you're going to have to spend time talking about 18 to 24-year-olds in Georgia. So sections for you are already written because you have a good research question. Uh, look at our second example. Uh, how does social media impact people? Well, poorly, wonderfully. I mean, I've, I've answered that in, in a question, right, in a word. This example isn't as bad as the first one, but we can do a little more with it. So uh, as a better example, how does Facebook and Twitter impact the mental health of teenagers? Again, here you can see I've identified social media and I've broken it out to two main social media camps. And now I'm talking about the impact of mental health rather than just the impact of people. And I've defined it to an age population being teenagers. So a good research question will give you the keywords. These keywords are going to be uh, located in item records that you research. So, for example, if we look at this question, how does Facebook and Twitter impact the mental health of teenagers? We can look for the words Facebook, Twitter, social media, social network, mental health, wellness, mental disorder, happiness, teenager, teen, 13 to 19, because we have a good research question, we have good terms that we can search. And these terms are going to be in the records that exist for all of the material we're going to look to find. So I'm talking about these things like records and material. One of the things you need to know is that when Google or the library or Bing or, or whatever engine you're using to find results, uh, it has an item. They look at the item through a computer and they make a list of all of the words that are in there. Or a human has gone in and read it and made key terms. These key terms are really what you're searching. Uh, and the computer does this through boole Boolean logic. Now, I don't know if you've ever sat down and actually looked at a logic table and done these things. I'm not going to make you do this. I'm not going to make you do P or Q and R, like just not doing that. Uh, but you should know how these things work because they let you combine some of these key terms. So for example, Boolean operators, if you use the end to Boolean operator, you're going to combine the two terms, meaning those two terms have to appear in the source. So if I did Facebook and mental health, it's going to look for sources with the word Facebook and the words mental health. That's super useful and will narrow down the amount of results you get. Alternatively, you could broaden this with the Boolean operator or. So let's just say you're doing the social media and mental health or Facebook or Twitter uh, and mental health. Uh, research paper, and you're not terribly concerned if your source is talking about Facebook or Twitter. Well, you could put that right into the search box and do Facebook or Twitter. And what this will do is it'll look for sources that contain this word or this word or both. 
the not operator, so you could say uh, Facebook, not Instagram, for an example, would exclude sources that contain the, the second word. This is actually my favorite Boolean operator because it helps to narrow down the results you're looking at. So if you did this, Facebook, not Instagram, it would bring you results that contained the word Facebook, but also exclude the results that contained the word Instagram. This is helpful and it limits things, but it can also limit things that you want to find. So you want to use it uh, a little sparingly. Uh, just to give the visual learners, because I'm definitely a visual learner, a little bit uh, cute. This is the result of uh, the Boolean and. So this yellow circle is everything that contained the letter A. And this blue circle is everything that contained the letter B. And the overlap right here, A and B, is what would be brought back with the Boolean and. If we use the Boolean or, so if we said A or B, the results could come from any of these circles. It could be, you know, something over here or something over here or even in the overlap. It doesn't matter because we're saying we want A or B and it'll bring us things with anything that has one of those words or one of those letters. If you said A not B, it would only bring you back things from that circle of A. It would exclude things that had A and B. So it would exclude anything that that B circle touched and only the things that the yellow circle uh, has, specifically not that overlap. Okay, so we talked about some basic Boolean operators, but there's a little more. So earlier on, I talked about mental health and I said it would search the words mental health. That's true. It, it would use the Boolean end to search it if I did Facebook and mental health. It would automatically insert another end between mental and health. What you really want to do is put it in quotes. So for example, if I wanted to search for mental health, I wouldn't just put mental health in the search box. Since I know that's a phrase, I would put it in quotes. What that's going to do is force all of my results to have the words mental and health right next to each other. Now, uh, wildcards. I know some people who swear by these things and absolutely love them because they are helpful. Uh, this will really expand your search beyond what you thought was possible. So say, for example, you wanted to look up teenagers or teens or anything with that root of uh, teen. You could just do teen and then the asterisk or the wild card, and it would bring you back everything that had a word with the rest of the root in it. Super helpful, but will absolutely explode your search. So you, you want to test these things out. You want to play with them. You want to go to Google or Galileo or any of your search engines and just give this a try. So like I said earlier, your research question is going to lead to effective searching. So we tossed around this question earlier. How does Facebook and Twitter impact the mental health of teenagers? Well, how would you conduct that search? I've broken out all the keywords here, like I did a couple slides ago. What would you put into Google? What would you put into Bing? Well, here's some search strings that I think could work. You could do uh, social media in quotes, because that's a phrase, and, because we're using our billion operator, mental health in quotes again, because that's a phrase, not Snapchat, because our paper is not about Snapchat, and teen with the wild card, because we're going to pick up teenagers and all of that. Uh, or tweens. We're going to add tweens in there because, you know, they're sort of kind of almost teenagers. Alternatively, you could look at things like social network, in quotes, because it's a phrase, and happiness, which is a related concept to mental health. Um, I think the most direct way to do this is to do Facebook and Twitter and mental health in quotes. Word of caution. I have seen students, after they learn about phrase searching, put their entire research question in quotes in the Google and then say, I can't find any sources. You want to be careful about that. You want to make sure 
that you're only putting the things that are phrases in quotes. Otherwise, you will get no results. So why bother with this, right? This is a pain. Why am I having to use end or not wildcards, phrase searching, learning about Boolean operators? Like, what's up with that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, the way search engines and databases really work behind the scenes is that they use spiders and robots to go out and make an index of the web. You get it? Like the spider crawls the web. I think that's pretty funny. Uh, anyway, so they're going out and they're making the list of all the words that exist on the page. And that is called metadata. That's the data about the data. And when you put search terms in that search box, it's looking for those words. And this is how you can trick the computer to bring you back the things that are actually related to your paper. Now, this is how many of the search engines that you use actually operate. Google and Bing use this, and databases use this. So what you've learned here is applicable in personal life and school life. I do wanna throw out that uh, Google is changing how they do search results, meaning that they know so many people who clicked this or clicked an article, really wanted to also view this article, even though the words aren't in it. And because Google has that kind of high-level data, they will also include that second source in there, even if it doesn't contain those words. That's helpful, but not always when you're trying to do an academic paper. Sometimes you really do want the things that contain the words you're looking for. And that's where Galileo and ProQuest and EBSCO and Gale all come in handy because they let you do this more refined searching to find what you want. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to me at jfleschn at highlands.edu. Uh, also, as a reminder, make sure to complete your keyword assignment this week. That is super important. Um, all right, all. Well, Thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you later.